the challenge is remaining naive and foolishly ambitious amongst ever accumulating experience. That's very hard to strike that balance. When to turn your experience on and when to turn it off. Because if it's on all the time, you'll never do anything because you're too aware of the obstacles. What I've always tried to do is use that limitless creative energy to try and stretch the boundaries of resource and possibility and achievability as much as possible. It was just the most exquisite feeling. It was just me and the work at 5 a.m. And I allowed myself a rare sense of accomplishment. Hello and welcome back to the Installation Art Podcast. Today's episode is the second half of my conversation with British artist Alex Chinnick. So if you missed the previous episode, go back now and listen to part one first. But now, without further ado, we're going to jump straight back into the conversation where it left off last time. <laughs> What would you say has been the top skill you've had to learn and hone to do the kind of work you do now? That's such a good question. The challenge, as I said, is remaining naive. Remaining naive and kind of foolishly ambitious amongst ever accumulating experience. That's very hard to strike that balance. When to turn your experience on? and when to turn it off. Because if it's on all the time, you'll never do anything because you're too aware of the obstacles. I think that's a very difficult question. I think, as I say, facilitation over fabrication. Facilitation is a real art form. And in the absence of facilitation, it's very hard to make something kind of ambitious materially exist. Mm -hmm. um, there's real shortcuts now. Like social media is, is a shortcut. Social media is a shortcut to success. And it's a shortcut to attention. You know, and this is, this is where comparison is the thief of joy and resentment creeps in. Because the problem with a lot of social media is that the, the success and the attention is very rarely deserved. You know, I mean, there's this nice saying, something like, you know, it takes 10 years to become an overnight success. Yeah. Right? And now it takes one post. It's like the game's changed a little bit, but something like Anselm Kiefer and the documentaries there, they just blissfully cement the idea of accumulating a legacy and of building a world. And that, you can't rush that. Hype is one thing, but quality and permanence is another. And, and all I trust now is quality. The initial works were wonderful in their theatricality and uh, the immediacy of their, their offering in every single way. But there was an absence of quality. And I, the one thing I really trust now is quality. But what is my skill? I guess my skill uh, is the ability. I'm, I'm good at knowing a little bit about everything. Right? Mm -hmm. In the sense, if I sit in a structural engineering meeting, I, I, I'd like to think I make a very valuable contribution. If I sit in a marketing meeting, I make a very valuable contribution. If I sit in a technical meeting, if I have to give a lecture, if I'm meeting a commissioner, you know, you have to wear lots of different hats. And I know that there's this temptation as an artist to be like, no, 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 I, I've literally got a hat. But it's like, no, this is my hat and this is what I wear, how I, you know, like I only wear one hat, take it or leave it. That's great. That's great. But the reality in terms of delivering, um, projects in the public realm at scale what large yeah the scale is large so large projects in the public realm design demands flexibility and a degree of fluidity you know you have to wear different hats you have to be different people you know, like if there's people on site and they're trades people and they they work and talk and act in a certain way i have to be able to have a good relationship and create a friendship or a positive dialogue with them in the same way that I, you know, the billionaire and owner of the company comes along and, you know, wants to have a chat. 
it, yeah. it's about wearing lots of different hats I suppose, and somehow making them genuine it's mm-hmm. it's like my work i suppose it's all different but there's this common visual language sculptural language that travels through it and you can you can wear lots of different hats but it's still you and i guess that's the skill mm-hmm. but i can't stress enough the art of facilitation and ambition like ambition and risk it's a confusing time in terms of the, the idea of ambition and risk at the moment and it's a frustrating time because we could spend a year working every single day to pull off i don't know a truck that does a loop de loop right that's made with a loop de loop but we can render it in two days you know if we can digitally create something in two days that takes two years to make exist that's complicated so ambition and obsession are, are critical. That's really applying to the, the art of making things physically exist. Whether those things are so crucial in an ever digital age where the creation of the image, not the physical thing, but the image is so much, so much quicker, and so much less labor intensive. I don't know whether those things are so essential now. It's a very fast changing landscape. Yeah. And there was a time where I went really mad. There was a time where I just went mad over uh, the comparative ease with which the digital image was being created versus the physical sculpture. But I've kind of made peace with it now. And what I do is create things that exist in the, in the tangible way. The, the seemingly tangible world that surrounds us. I mean, your work almost looks like it could be AI generated. You know, like I look through Instagram looking for people who do installation and often I come across something that's like monumental. And I'm like, oh, that's so cool. And then I'm like, uh, no, no, that's not real. That's AI. <laughs> and and yeah. your work could be, yeah. could be that, but it's not, it's real. In a way, like that's that's the perfect compliment. In the sense, like that defies logic. That shouldn't exist. Yeah. That can't exist. That has to be digital. I don't know. Maybe I'm one of the last of the, I don't know, last of the makers in that regard. But I hope that's not. a lovely thing to be. I hope not too. But and maybe maybe physicality and tangibility. Uh, while humans exist in the kind of the physical sense that we do, will always be a necessity. I certainly hope so. And I've got nothing against the digital art. I think where my frustration potentially comes is when people are selectively ambiguous about the fact it's digital or not. Mm-hmm. You know, like where, where they, they don't, don't say. Yeah, exactly. They don't say. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to names, but my word. My I'm... word. Also, there's some practitioners, right? And you see the word and they're like, wow. And everyone's like, where is this? Where is this? Where is this? This is amazing. Wow. Blah, blah. Wow. And then occasionally they get commissioned to do something real. And it looks like it doesn't look good. It's like, hang on. That one doesn't look as, that one looks nothing like as good as all the, it's like, oh, okay, that one's going to, I'm not even going to say the material, but there are, yeah, big time, big time. And also be suspicious of people who are, showing lots of internal work. Like, firstly, be suspicious of someone who releases a new artwork every two days that's pretending to be real and where the background and floor are exactly the same in every single post. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. And there's never any people. No. And there's always one view. It's like, come on. Like, it's fine. And this is the world we live in now. But I, I like to think that there'll be a necessary transparency or some kind of hallmark that distinguishes between a digital creation and a real thing, but maybe not. Yeah. But at the same time, what? okay, so tomorrow I could release over 100 artworks in that way. I could tomorrow release, release 100 different images, digital creations of public artworks. Some of them are great. But I, I still choose not to. I've always... I've battled with this. You can probably tell I've really battled with this. But I, at the moment, my, my current conclusion is to 
be patient and prioritize the kind of the physical materialization of these works over there over the possible hype that their digital release might enjoy mm. is that a good idea i, I vote for that yeah potentially well thank you i mean it certainly doesn't it might not be a good commercial decision um it might not be a good marketing decision but it feels like the right creative path that's all i can go on so it's a strange world in that regard. Have you ever worked on something for ages and it never actually became reality? Oh, all the time. All the time. We were working on a project for Milan Design Week 2019 that was another level, about a 40 meter wide kinetic building um, that we spent a long time yes all the time all the time i mean there are projects that people don't know about that we've spent thousands of hours on that didn't materialize and it's lots of different reasons so milan 2019 was COVID, so that's a good example of that particular project now we have um, we've done so much work on that project uh, the structural engineering, the mechanical engineering, the digital design, the material prototyping, goes on and on. Um, significant investment. And the visuals exist in so many different formats. The digital animations exist. That's a good example. I mean, heartbreaking. Yeah. It, 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 I'm, I mean, I'm being dramatic and first world problems, but it tears me to pieces when these projects don't materialize, when you invest so much time, it just tears, tears me to pieces. But I resist the temptation to share it with the world in its digital existence because it will manifest again in the right time and the right place. It will happen again. Projects that we start and then are forced to stop, there's quite a few of them now that are, like one of them is being realized next summer, which is part fabricated. You know, it's been in a warehouse for a year because the project had to stop. Not because we did anything wrong, not because the commissioner did anything wrong. Without going into details, that was a complicated situation where it wasn't allowed to continue anymore, even though everyone wanted it. Long story, really weird. It's to do with the waterways and 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 um, mm. neighboring land to the commissioner. and the, I mean, Everyone wanted it. But apart from one company, couldn't allow it. Long story. Nothing to do with us. Anyway, um, that is being... That part fabricated, but that is now going somewhere else where I think better next year. So it happens all the time. And it takes, inc do you know what? The, the thing I've got is stamina. That's it. That's coming back to the question of what's the one thing? It's stamina. It's stamina. Yeah. Like creating public artworks when they get canceled or they get delayed or they don't get as much attention as the last one did. Uh, Attention's a funny thing. Like, so we know exactly what a crowd pleaser is. I know exactly now the buttons to press that will get lots of public praise and lots of media attention. But you can't, Sophie, a studio manager, she started to say, you know, this was one of the things where we pivoted. She was like, we've got to start making albums and stop making hit singles. Nice. And at the time, I just didn't get it. It sounded great. <laughs> but I didn't get it and it just began to make sense like we had to begin to build a broad and ever expanding offering creatively and commercially in terms of the output and I know like we've got things we're probably doing in the next two years there's some things that as I say we're going to return to some of the sculptural simplicity look we, we can build a to build one sliding house from scratch we could do that in a few months, but to build the foam box from scratch, which is twisting and it's got rippling glass, every single glass panel is different. You know, we had to work with the company uh, that does the glazing patterns for what just to just to get the glazing right, and that takes years. So I've gone down a path of varied size and sculptural complexity to kind of push my limits of sculptural exploration and how far we can push materials in their apparent fluidity or uh, whatever, you know. And now I feel like I'm in a place where I can sort of begin to return to things. Mm -hmm. So we'll do something very similar next year, like the slightly house, but in a slightly different way. 
an absolute crowd pleaser. The lampposts are exciting for me. The lampposts are really exciting because they have this ability to go everywhere and anywhere. And I really like this idea of kind of raindrops of public art, positive public art all over the place. I think there's something really positive about that and optimistic and uplifting. And that's why we started to make our knotted post boxes. So the post box, the red post box is the UK thing. And that we made those in bronze and they're painted red. We made a few of those and they tour around the UK. So I like the idea that we we kind of owned and we were the commissioners and creators of our own public artwork. And you put a post box anywhere, in any town, in any street, it works because it belongs there because there's yeah. over 100,000 around the UK. So I kind of like this idea of creating public artworks as well that can go all over the place and anywhere. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're now at this nice place where we know how to do things in all materials. Um, varying levels of complexity, lots of different sizes. And we're now in a place where we can return to all of them. You know, we can do all of it from the simple to the complex, to the small, to the challenging, to the popular. Popular doesn't always equal correct. It's not always the best response. The most popular one, sometimes the one that's the least popular will eventually have the strongest degree of legacy or slowly develop the most important contribution over time. And that's where the contextual response comes in. Can you yeah. tell me a bit more about the most recent facade works, like the zipping ones? In this case, do you build everything on site? Do you prefabricate parts of it and then transport it? How does it happen? The project for Milan was prefabricated. Um, the two zipping buildings were prefabricated and then largely built on site. So assembled on site. Um, the one for Milan was, oh, I don't know, 10 trucks, something like that. That was a huge team. That was huge artwork. Did everything go smoothly with the transport of that? Yeah, that was pretty smooth. That one was pretty smooth. We've had some nightmares. Tell me. Well, just like the peeling road got stuck mm -hmm. once. Um, stuck with a bridge yeah well i just they couldn't get under it and we had to reroute that wasn't our mistake but the logistics are stressful the unzipping buildings were pretty straightforward the unzipping buildings were interesting so when i was at art school i made this sheet of plywood that bends and i put teeth in it and i unzipped it and then eight nine ten years later I created the unzipping building in Milan and the unzipping factory floor. That was nice because we excavated the floor. So that was like a meter deep when it zipped up, you could see inside. Wow. And the unzipping walls, they were great. But it was nice how I created this one unzipping piece of plywood when I was at art school. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't know why, you know, you just follow your creative instincts. And then no one sees it, no one cares. You take a photo of it. Someone offered me, I think, 300 pounds for it. And then, I don't know, you know, we've been 10 years later, we've got hundreds of thousands of people pouring in a Milan Design Week to an unzipping building. It's really nice how, um, how as artists, you're kind of sowing these creative seeds and they might seem small and irrelevant and pointless or certainly underappreciated at the time. Yeah. But it's wonderful how they have the potential to grow. But like, you know, sickeningly i'm saying that from the position of someone who's pulled it off it's bloody hard to feel that way or adopt that philosophy when you just feel like you've been banging on the door for 20 years and no one's opening it so we've been very lucky that lucky is the wrong lucky is definitely the wrong word but i'm fortunate that you know some of these big ideas have, have found mechanisms and and platforms to exist certainly i'm very pleased about that what we need now though is a gallery we're now making so much smaller work. It's very interesting. My work, for whatever reason, maybe it's popularity or maybe it's accessibility or playfulness. And there's a degree of whimsy with my work. Like they walk a fine line. I always say this, but my work walks a fine line between sculpture and stunt. I think we've toned down the stunt a little bit. And in the past, we probably got it wrong. 
Sometimes it's tipped too far into stunt. But it's always come from a place of kind of sculptural intent. And um, I think now we're a lot better at that. I think it's because a lot of the forms and a lot of the huge material manipulations wear a kind of a playful mask and they're full of narrative and to a degree whimsy. I don't really see it as whimsy, but I can see why people read it as that. And it, for whatever reason, it's never really chimed with a, a gallery world. So I've never really been, I've always felt like a tourist in the art world, always. Mm -hmm. um, my upbringing was in the art sector. But as I say, we, we're starting to make a lot of small work now that can be kind of owned. Yeah, I've never once been approached by a gallery in the UK or America. Never once. Wow, really? Yeah, which maybe I'm being kind of an arrogant, you know, maybe this is just foolish arrogance, but I do find that a bit surprising. And particularly as we make a lot of smaller work now, uh, which, which finds collectors and, you know, finds buyers. But for whatever reason, UK and America never been approached by a gallery or a dealer. And there's something interesting about that. I don't know whether there's a disconnect between installation art or large public art and, and, and that kind of world. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, art dealers, if you're listening, there's a great opportunity here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe there is. Maybe. <laughs> or maybe you should just start your own gallery. Yeah, I think that too. But then, you know, there's not enough time anyway. Between... Yeah. Between three kids, the farm, and endless, endless amounts of sculptures, there's never any time. But it wasn't a complaint. It was just an observation, I suppose. I don't know whether the two worlds are slightly detached. Maybe they are. Maybe they are. It's, it's very hard to bridge the two. Like, I, I think it's very hard to make good, accessible public art and then desirable, collectible um, gallery-based work. They're, they require two different approaches. It, it happens. I mean, Kapoor does it well. Gormley does it brilliantly. Um, Richard Serra does it well. Michael Heiser does it beautifully. But, you know, Heiser and Serra, they're so uncompromising. But you do have to think differently. You have to really think differently. So it's hard. It's hard to do both, I think. Yeah. I have yeah. to wonder, like, is it yeah. maybe because... If an artist becomes successful and popular independently and just because they make these very attractive and accessible works and not going through the traditional art world system, uh, then maybe they're a bit kind of an outsider then as well. Yeah, maybe. And there's something quite nice about that. There's something lovely about that. All I can do is to make the work that I want to make. That's all you can do as an artist. I mean, you can do, you can make the work that you think people want to see, but that's a terrible, that's a terrible foundation to build your creative output from. Mm. I've always enjoyed kind of serving my work on a bed of familiarity and accessibility in terms of kind of using the, the material world around us as the basis and then disrupting that kind of playfully lend the work and accessibility and it potentially therefore runs the risk of being void of consideration it's certainly void of conceptual i've always avoided the bs like i've always avoided attaching bs on the end of something just to try and give it conceptual weight that's not to say that conceptual work is bs that's not that at all it's just it wouldn't have been an authentic attachment to the work but what the work is, is highly contextually responsive and very, very considered. Um, it just wears a kind of a playful mask. You know, an art, a brilliant artwork can be difficult, challenging, hard, um, almost unpleasant, but brilliant in such. But simultaneously, it can be positive, joyful, uplifting, and charming. And I guess I subscribe to the latter. I guess I subscribe to the latter, and I've never attached much conceptual weight to the work. Maybe that, I never, you know, I try not to overthink these things. You just have to get on with it and make the work that you want to make. Someone said, like, when I was trying to think about what to make, they said, well, if you walked into a gallery, what would you want to see? And I thought, yeah, that's nice. 
that's a pretty good way of going about it. So I've kind of always done that with the work. And going through the more traditional channels of um, BA, MA, dealer, gallery, selling lots of work, invitation to make a public artwork, I just didn't ever have the, I just didn't have the patience. Or mm -hmm. that just felt counterintuitive. I had the ideas and I had the energy and I had the appetite to make them happen now. So that's always what I did. And I think that's probably the best way to go about it now. Your approach is very different from what I'm used to. And it's very fresh and inspirational, I have to say. You've talked yeah. now about... Nice to hear. <laughs> the um, impermanence of your work. You know, a lot of your larger works are temporary. What happens to things like the floating building once the event is over? Well, partly why I needed a farm was because I like to keep lots of it. So, yeah, we keep large parts of it. Okay. So we would keep wind and columns and um, the temporary works, we keep a lot of it. The melting house, I can't remember the name of the company, but There was tons and tons of just melted wax with bits in it. That went to a firelighter company. I can't remember who they were called. Mm -hmm. But basically, we filled up a skit and that, well, more than one skit, and that went to a firelighter company. Some parts get destroyed. Yeah, a combination of destroyed, reused, but mainly stored. Mainly stored, yeah. And so... One of my barns is like a reclamation yard. It's full of windows and columns and, and knotted columns and huge logs from Arizona, concrete rugs, uh, <laughs> lots of things. I mean, honestly, if I die tomorrow, my poor wife will just have this, this barn of just utter baggage. You know, it's like, so we can't move now. Because there's so much stuff in there. Yeah. But yeah, it's kind of a combination of things. The thing about, so it, it takes a while to get good at permanent art. That's hard. Temporary art is, it's not, it's not easy and it depends what you're making, but it's a lot easier. So with temporary work, you, you have a creative freedom. That's for sure. Permanence is a little bit of a cage to creative freedom. With impermanent work, you have far less material restrictions. So your material palette is much broader because material longevity is less of a concern. In terms of the conceptual or contextual response, you have tremendous freedom. So, you know, if you're installing something on Covent Garden Piazza in front of a very historic building, you can do that if it's there for a month, but you're never going to be allowed to do that for 10 years so you have administration freedom now in terms of permanence you have to design the artwork utterly with permanence in mind so your material decisions your technical decisions um just the manual i mean the manual that comes with our lamppost is still like 30 pages long wow. you, you, you have to take a different approach conceptually contextually creatively technically materially it's a very different thing and it's it's harder so It's taken us some time to get good at permanent public art. And I think, I like to think we're really getting there. The trouble is mm -hmm. to refine your practice and learn lessons, you have, to, you have to learn them on a very public stage. This isn't to say that anything we've created is wrong. It's just, I think we're getting better. Um, I love the temporary work. I love it. And the, the theatricality and the freedom that it permits But I also think there's a place for longer lasting work. And we, we really spend time on both, actually. One is about just creating hype and one is about trying to kind of contribute to history, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, one is about animated space, but another is about elevating it. There's slightly different approaches creatively. You know, we've invested a lot of time and effort into getting good at both. The budgets are bigger with permanence, which is obviously a kind of an attractive consideration. But having said all of this, I really think that permanent art 
needs to be open to the idea of being removed after a period of time. It's very possible that a public artwork no longer makes a positive contribution after 10 years, 15 years, mm. 20 years, 25 years, for whatever. Whether it just feels a bit lifeless in the context, because context has changed around it, whether it simply needs refurbishment, like whether it's, it's fatigued to a point of making a not a positive contribution, but a negative one, or whether for whatever reason it's done its job and its contribution and legacy would be kind of more valuable in, in its absence, like it's done. I think that people need to be open to that because public art is tricky, as hard as it is. Firstly, as I say, you're quite often dealing with people who haven't done it much before. And yeah, you might be in your studio and you make 100 paintings and after 100 paintings, you get stuck in good. But with public art, you're going to make 100 not so good pieces before you start getting good. And that means there's a lot of bad public art out there. The other problem with yeah. public art is that the funding, the fund, so you've got a lot of inexperienced practitioners creating public art. And the commissioner has a responsibility to make sure it's permanent for whatever reason, the local council, local authority, to justify the spend, it needs to be permanent. So for all of those reasons, you've got a lot of inexperienced practitioners delivering long-lasting public art, and that's a bad recipe. The other problem is, is budgets. It's so often seen to, as a requirement and not a necessity. You know, no art is a necessity. Like No individual artwork is a necessity. But the collective impact and offering and, and social role that the arts play is an absolute necessity. But no individual artwork is. And it's often a requirement at the end of something, a much bigger spend. Um, let's say the best example is developers. And developers are arguably the best commissioners of public artworks in the world. It's wonderful. You know, and a good developer who has the right philosophy can facilitate wonderful, wonderful public artworks. But quite often, it's an unwelcome requirement and they minimize the spend on it. And ultimately, what you're left with is an exquisite building with wonderful public realm spend, like, you know, architects creating brilliant buildings with fantastic budgets and this kind of afterthought and after spend on a, a requirement of public art. And it, you know, don't get me wrong, that's great. It's better than nothing, but it just presents public art in probably a negative light against the backdrop of brilliant architecture. So what I'm getting at is it adds up, potentially accumulates to a risk that there's a lot of bad public artworks out there. And there are. And look, maybe I'm responsible for some of them. But firstly, it's very difficult to develop the experience in terms of understanding what makes a good public artwork and how you make it, um, certainly in a permanent sense, and also being open to the idea of removing it. So a lot of our contracts now, we have this kind of freedom to, we certainly have 10-year arrangements in place to discuss whether it would be better removed. You know, wow. And that's okay. not like the, to turn commissioners off. It's just the truth. That's experience. Yeah, That's experience. So, yeah, it's a complicated field. It's a difficult field. I love it, though. So where is some public art that people can go and look at now of your work? Well, right now we have, where do we have? We have a few post boxes around the UK. We have the exploding spiral staircase in Brighton. That was mm -hmm. hard. That's a 35 meter spiral staircase that unravels and explodes in all directions. It looks insane. Yeah, that one's hard. That one's hard. I mean, the form is beautiful. That that one's one of those rare sculptures that from the side is probably more beautiful from the front. But that's full of narrative and that's that that's in Brighton. Then our inverted electricity pylon is in London on the Greenwich Peninsula. And then we have a cracked building, huge cracked facade in Hammersmith in London. And then we're installing a couple of bronze post boxes next year, uh, lots of lamp posts, hopefully around Europe, but certainly in the UK. And uh, in Nancy in France, there's a series of um, metal sculptures on buildings. And then in the summer, as I say, we're installing this new 
uh, permanent public artwork in the UK, which would be wonderful. I'm very excited about. So yeah, all over the place. They're, they're all over the place, basically. And next year is kind of a combination of temporary works and um, permanent works. But we're beginning to self-facilitate again. We're beginning to go out and find derelict buildings again, mm. which is really exciting. I'll be looking forward to seeing that. And also, we're developing something for America. We're developing a, a series of 50 sculptures for America that I'm excited about, really excited about. So, yeah, all over the place. It never ends. It never ends. It's an exhausting, never-ending journey. I think that's what an <laughs> artist is. This kind yep. This kind of blissful, torturous, never-ending journey. Sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. So what would you say has been the proudest moment of your career so far? Well, I think at the beginning when I had never made a public artwork before, and I'd been going in and out of this derelict factory with all of the soil and, you know, rats and asbestos and foxes. When I stepped back and I created the 312 identically smashed windows, that, that was a real moment. That was a real moment. And then the, the positive attention and the media response that it enjoyed, that really felt for the first time like, the input and the recognition were close for the first mm -hmm. time. That was the first time there'd ever been a relationship between enormous input and a sense of acknowledgement. So that was a big one. Um, but there's been lots of kind of personal moments. I, I mean, look, there's been lots of moments where people have come or people have seen things and you know, brought me to tears for different reasons. But I think probably the most beautiful moment I've ever had was um, I just finished the unzipping building in Milan. And that was, that was a big artwork. And we got it right. It was, we really got that one right in every way. And inside there was this wonderful unzipping floor, which I loved, which is where we excavated the factory floor, re-poured a new floor, so it's peeling up and you could look down under the floor. And then there was this huge unzipping wall on the inside as well. And I couldn't sleep. And I woke up. I was in the hotel in Milan. It was about 5 a.m. Hotel got me a cab. And I went to the site. It was just me. And there was just me and security guards. And I walked around it. And I had headphones on. And I was playing the, the latest Tom York album. It was beautiful. And... It was just the most exquisite feeling. Like there was just, it was just me and the work at 5 a.m. And I allowed myself a rare sense of accomplishment. Coming back to one of the first questions you asked, one of my two favorite quotes, well, is only the paranoid survive. And um, I think the way that I kind of deal with that is I, I have this incredible kind of creative anxiety as a practitioner. And the way I can solve that is by just working extremely hard and taking risks. And I very rarely, when I complete an artwork, there's never a sense, there's very, very, very rarely a sense of accomplishment. It's just I'm on to the next. You know, I'm done with the last, I'm on to the next. And that's not because I don't like the work or because I don't want to give value to the work. It's just because I think it's born from this notion of only the paranoid survive and this kind of ever ongoing anxiety to keep producing. And there, in that moment at 5 a.m. in Milan, surrounded by these three artworks, I, I felt a tremendous sense of accomplishment. Like, I kind of allowed myself to feel proud of that, and that was a wonderful feeling. That was a that was really, really beautiful morning, just that half an hour. Then I'm back on email panicking about the next projects. So <laughs> that was a lovely little moment. Yeah. I mean, when I look back retrospectively, I'm really, I'm really proud of the portfolio that I've accumulated. Like the portfolio means so much to me. And, I, and at the time when I'm knee deep in the projects, it feels stressful or irrelevant. You know, I mean, it's a kind of creative journey that everyone goes on. You have the idea, you think it's the best thing that's ever been made. You start looking into it, you realize this is really hard to achieve. 
Then halfway through, you start saying, is it any good? Then you finish it. You think, oh, it's great. And it all happens so quickly. But sometimes you need like eight years or so to look back and say, that was good. That was, that was worthwhile. We need to explore that again. So I'm only just getting into that territory. It's been 10 year whirlwind of sculpture after sculpture after sculpture after sculpture. So now we're slowly getting into a place where we can begin to kind of calm it down and start to think about going back. And sometimes the best way to go forward is to go back a little bit. So next year, we're going to do an identically smashed window piece again. Mm. And it's been 10 years since we did that one. I was always terrified of repetition. I always felt that repetition represented the point where you'd run out of ideas. But I think there's, there's something to be said for it. I always say there's a fine line between repetition and refinement. And I think now, because we make such different work and so many different materials and processes and people, um, I think now I can kind of justify the idea of exploring refinement a little bit. Mm, yeah. yeah. I definitely love a little self-reference moment to like previous work. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Mm. It's needed, I suppose. It's needed. It's it's like when you find an old sketchbook or something, a sketchbook from eight years ago, and you flick through and you kind of stumble upon a doodle of an idea, and you think, oh, that was good. Mm -hmm. That was good. But at the time, for whatever reason, you just kind of, at the time, it just didn't feel right. So yeah, slowly becoming, beginning, allow myself to look back a little bit. Yeah. Hence why I agreed to this. I don't normally agree. Like I don't normally ah. do. Like I'm starting to do interviews. Again. I stopped as well. That was another thing I did. I stopped. Why? But I think it's okay to. Do it again. I think there was a time in the world where you just couldn't win, uh, and maybe that's now still. Maybe I've made peace of it. I just think like there was a time, particularly during COVID, where anything you said left you open for attack. And there comes a point where you've just got to say, well, you just got to take the risk, you know, and just be able to have conversations. There was this real time where anything you said left you open for attack and any opportunity for people to release animosity or to kind of vent, they would take it. It just felt like society became a search party for fault. And it was just not looking for anything that anyone was doing right. It's just trying to find anything that anyone could do wrong. And that, that society coming from a deeply negative place. And that's not a collaborative society. That's antagonistic and tense. And I just didn't want to play that game. And now I'm open to it again, maybe because I'm just tired of feeling that way or whether I feel like potentially that tension has reduced somewhat. Maybe it hasn't at all. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, but I hope this podcast is a safe space. And um, I think this has been a delightful and inspiring conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for caring. Thanks for asking the questions. I appreciate it. It's nice to go on a little journey. Yeah, I've really enjoyed learning from you. And I appreciate your perspective. It's given me a lot of food for thought. I think I'm going to incorporate some of the lessons you've just taught me today about oh. facilitation over fabrication. Well, thank you for saying that. Yeah, I can't stress that enough. It's funny, whenever I say, oh, this worked for three years or something, there's always someone who's a maker or a fabricator who's like, three years? Well, I could do that in two months. It's like, yeah. Facilitation and fabrication, they're two very, very, very different things. But maybe I'm really talking to sculptors there. I, I mean, obviously, I'm talking to makers and architects and stuff, but yeah. Yeah. Like the things I've thought of are not mind blowing in the context of architecture. But architecture has got a different set of parameters and rules. It's, it's like this would never happen, could never happen probably should never happen you know like yeah. art is liberated by the absence of function like i know that art has a function if anyone i know art has a function it's just not in its kind of physical sense let's say whereas a building does and function facilitates enormous budgets because of its obvious need art while it has a 
different kind of social function. I know. <laughs> I, I'm not talking to you while I say, I just, I, I, it, it's a different set of parameters, a different set of budgets, but it permits this creative freedom that is to a degree where possible unbound by function or the need to perform. So in some ways, creatively, it has limitless possibility, but in terms of resource, it has very finite possibility. And um, I guess what I've always tried to do is use that limitless creative energy to try and stretch the boundaries of resource and possibility and achievability um, as much as possible. And that's kind of what I've always continued to do. So I guess whatever kind of practitioner you are, there's something to be said for that, I suppose, in the arts. Because I, I mean, the arts is a funny thing. I, I say it doesn't have a function, of course. As I said, an individual artwork is not crucial, but the arts in general are essential. And yes, the creation of pleasure is not more important than the prevention of pain, obviously. The prevention of pain should always come first. I'm not suggesting it shouldn't. But in a world where there is pain, there's also the opportunity for pleasure. The existence of the arts is essential. Um, and the kind of the positive role it can play and the escapism from reality that it can offer. There's so much to be said for that. And so without kind of becoming over pretentious about the value of art and the arts, I do certainly think public art has a role to play and a positive role to play. And it shouldn't always be with this kind of this, this attack of it being frivolous. It's not, but it does have a role. You know, hopefully the creation of pleasure can play some small role as well, hopefully. I think it does. You've worked with so many tradies and people whose main job is building an architecture. Have you ever had to like, I don't know, explain to them why why you're doing what you're doing and why it's not needed to be done in the way they usually do things because X, Y, Z. Yeah, absolutely. All the time. <laughs> All the time. The right collaborators kind of see the value in it. And quite often the right collaborators welcome the, the shift. Um, like you might be working on a particular project where someone does something all the time in exactly the same way. And they get invigorated by the invitation and the, the challenge to use their skill set in a different way or a new way. Normally that happens. And I really enjoy that. But yeah, you've got to, I don't know, you've got to try and take everyone on the journey as much as possible. The audience, of course, but the people creating the artwork with you. Yeah, normally it's, it's good. Normally, as I say, the right collaborators take it on and the right collaborators welcome the shift in their day-to-day -day activity, I suppose. And I don't know, I like to think, I mean... You'd have to ask them, and they probably not. Maybe they wouldn't disagree. But I like to think that a lot of the time, the, all the different people we work with step back and are really proud of the work that they've created. I hope so. I hope so. Because, like, obviously, none of the work would exist without me. Every single one of these projects, if if you took me out, it wouldn't be. Them. But a lot of them individually would not have been possible, or would not exist as well as they do without the collaborators and the people involved. I mean, there's been so many people. An early collaborator was a man called Richard Nutborn, uh, Richard Nutborn Scenic Studio, who do scenic work and painting. And he's just a master of his craft, absolute master of his craft. And that early work was really brought to life with him. I mean, he's just one of many, but there's been so many crude collaborators. Uh, Jonathan, who I work with, is just a brilliant, brilliant craftsman. But everyone's brilliant in their different way. As I say, Sophie, my studio manager, she's just brilliant at what she does. And so, yeah, if you took a lot of these people away, the work wouldn't be half as good. So I hope they're proud. I hope they're individually proud of the work that we create together. Yeah. Well, I would love to stay here and ask you a million more questions, but <laughs> I think if I stay much longer than the alarm in the building will go off because <laughs> it automatically turns on. It's good. I've got to go for lunch with Tony, the wax man, anyway. Oh, yeah, that's so, right. Yeah. Um, where should the listeners go to 
check out your work, maybe buy something, look at things, follow you? Well, the buying is possible but tricky. In the no, no, that's a terrible answer. This is why this is why I need a good dealer. Um the buying is possible, but you know, the, the ownable artworks are um they're not inexpensive, you know. This is they're made in bronze and silver. But the best place to see the work is the website, which is alexchinnock.com. A-L-E-X-C-H-I-N-N-E-C-K.com. Alexchinnock.com. If you look at the website, we put a lot of time into photography and we work with lots of different photographers around the world. And the photography of the work is a huge part of it, huge part yeah. of the process and the project. So the website's a lovely place to see that. And that shows all of the projects in more detail. So I think there on Instagram, it's at Alex Chinook, which, you know, I probably don't use as effectively as I should, but certainly when we're creating new work, it's on there. So alexchinook.com and at Alex Chinook on Instagram. They're the two places to kind of see and hopefully enjoy the work. Yep. We'll have yep. all the links in the show notes. Thanks. Well, there you go. That's it. That's me. Well, thanks again, Alex. It's been a real pleasure. I'm really tired now because it's almost 11 p.m. here, but um, that's not yeah. an indication of my level of excitement. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Wow. Right? How amazing is Alex and his work? I feel so privileged to have had this conversation and I am super inspired. Like, what am I even doing with my life? That was British artist Alex Chinnock, based in Kent, UK. You must go check out his work on his website, alexchinnock.com, and his Instagram, at alexchinnock. All links are in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening to the Installation Art Podcast. Do you know someone who would enjoy this conversation as much as I did? Share the podcast with them. 